got to talk about our personal journey in the context of scripture. And sometimes I feel led to talk specifically about us as a nation or nations. The letter to Timothy reminds him to pray for all people. Not just for Christians, but for pagans too. Not just for the lowly, but for those in high places. Paul makes it clear that these prayers are for kings and administrators, are particularly for the purpose of being able to live peaceably, to live out one's faith with dignity. The reason the church is to pray like this in order to continue to have the opportunity to proclaim the good news of God's grace and reconciling action through Jesus Christ. This epistle makes it clear that God intends for the message to get out that Jesus' life was a ransom for all, not just the good, not just the Jews, but all. Jesus didn't just die for Americans, but for every nation. Jesus didn't just die for Christians, he died for Muslims too. So Paul is telling us to remember to pray for those in power, not just our president and leaders, but every king, every prime minister, every president, every dictator, every leader, every Fuhrer, every single person, either good or bad, who holds leadership in order that we might be able to live in peace, in order to share the love of God in Christ Jesus with every human being. Paul knew when, when he said this, that emperors might be, might be prosecuted and persecuted. Those in authority might be determined to stamp out Christians. He said it and knew that. But the Christian church was to never, even in the times of bitterest persecution, cease to pray for them. It's unbelievable to realize that the early church, even during the days of bitterest persecution, still regarded as an absolute duty to pray for the emperor and his subordinates, including kings and governors. This command <clears throat> to pray for the emperor is written by one who is on his way to try under Roman law <clears throat> for being a troublemaker among the Jews and a possible subversive towards the Roman Empire. Paul, according to tradition, is likely beheaded just outside the city of Rome around 60 AD, more or less. Around four years later, Nero, the emperor, begins an intense persecution of the Christians. Someone begins to set fire to Rome, and Nero blame the Christians. It's always politically helpful to blame the minority within a society that is unpopular with everybody else. It was done back then. It still does today. So the Christ followers get the blame. Nero had Christians attacked by wild animals in the Colosseum to entertain the masses. Thank you, sister. He would have Christians tied to posts and then tarred and set aflame to light Nero's garden parties. He was monstrously cruel. Yet the church continued to pray for him as Paul told them. These Jewish Christians 
Even continue to pray for those in power when Rome got sick and tired of the Jewish rebellions and six years later, around 70 AD, destroyed the great temple and leveled Jerusalem. They leveled it to the ground, scattering the believers to the four corners of the earth. These persecutions continued by local magistrates and emperors on and off for the next 300 years. Yet the church continued to pray for the leaders of the nations. <clears throat> As the church, despite the persecution, the church grew in the midst of persecution. There was increased persecution because of emperor worship and the demand to unite the empire under it. Uh, one of the difficulties Rome had was how do you hold a huge empire that spread out for thousands and thousands of miles? There was multiple worship of a wide variety of gods, but one of the things that they required was, well, let us have one central worship, and that is we will, we will worship the emperor at least give credence to emperor worship. So you could end up walking into a, a temple which had all kinds of different gods there. You could worship any god you wanted to, but you always had to throw a little pinch of incense toward the emperor's bust to show that you were politically correct. And that you respected the emperor. And what you would do is you take a little pinch of incense and you throw it into the fire and you say, Caesar is Lord. Pretty simple. Okay, I'm probably like you can stand up in front of in baseball games, sing the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, sometimes people stand up, put their hand on their on their heart or whatever to show that they're they're patriotic, etc. And sometimes it means something to them, sometimes it doesn't mean anything to them. But there were Christians who believed that only one Lord existed, and that was Jesus Christ. And because Jesus Christ is Lord, they could not say to the, to the emperor, the emperor is Lord. And so a great deal of persecution began to happen to Christians who had been told by Paul, pray for your leaders. It was not until around 313 AD when Emperor Constantine, who had a vision, he had to marry a wife who was a Christian. He had no idea how much influence that was, but he had a vision one night. He dreamed he was getting ready for a battle. And he dreamed that if he painted a cross on the shields of his warriors, that they would win the battle. And he commanded, and they won. And so he, he, put his, he put his weight in the direction of the God who seemed to be in favor of him, at least in that moment. And Constantine began the, the beginning of a breakdown of persecution. It ended, began to end under Constantine that the church was persecuted around 313. And I know this is history and you're thinking, where's the sermon and all that? We're getting there, hopefully. <laughs> Constantine stopped persecuting Christians. You can clearly see why the Christian church would be so relieved. By 380, things had the tide had changed so much. 380 AD, Emperor Theodosius had made Christianity the state church. They actually began to turn over pagan temples to the Christians. Before they worshipped in homes. So now they were gaining positions of power and they were even having pagan temples turned over. So the advantage of being part of a state church was officially it became a Christian empire, officially. With all the advantages and authority that that entails, 
It obtained financial and material and legal perks from the state. It, it had help of the emperor to fight against heresies uh, and paganism. The emperor could, could command certain things, and you had to go along. And the persecution essentially ended. But the disadvantages were these. The church became integrated into the state and the state into the church. The state intervened in the life of the church, but expected theological support from it. If they decided to go have a war, if they decided to treat certain groups a certain way, they expected the church to support them. The emperor tried to smooth over doctrinal conflicts which upset law and order. The emperor could call a meeting of the church council. The church became imprisoned in a political and cultural framework which dulled the fervor of the gospel. They were now having to cooperate with the state. Even before Constantine, he reinforced it. At the end of the third century, some bishops had adopted a style of power close to, to that of Roman governors. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so it became a temptation for the church during this time. The great relief that they did not have to be constantly wary of being put to death and hound and then suddenly they are being sucked in to a relationship with the state. By the way, this is why we believe in separation of church and state. This, is, this was the first time a nation was made officially a Christian nation. And at the, it ended up being a disaster. And every time in history it's been tried again, it's been a disaster. The seduction of power is too much. And besides, it goes against everything Jesus teaches about choosing to follow him rather than being forced to follow him. It was always a choice when Jesus made it. There are some in our own culture and other cultures that believe that people need to be forced toward Christianity or other religions. It also goes against the central teaching about God being our protector and not the state. There's a reason Paul wants us to pray for those in power. Those who have authority because of their position whether democratically elected or dictator for life, are in constant danger of the temptation of power. They need our prayers. Desperate. So what about us here today in America? Our churches have become so comfortable domesticated in the American culture that they often operate with little sense of tension or contradiction between what they're doing as Christians and what they stand for as Americans. That is to say our Christianity has become so accommodating to the prevailing culture that we have, have practically telescoped the mission of the church into the purpose of the nation. Many Christians think of their historic destiny not in terms of something that we call the kingdom of God, but rather in terms of national purpose. The notion of America as bearer of a special destiny for the whole world. We have not yet learned that nations are only temporary forms of organizing people in their historic existence. That nations rise and they fall. And that God's ultimate purpose does not depend on any of them. The U.S. has only been around for just under 250 years. 
the Almighty managed very well, thank you, in getting out the good news of the gospel before we were in existence. Historically, we are barely the new kid on the block compared to some nations that have existed 500, 700, even 1,000 years. We fear that somehow God will be dethroned if the United States does not get its way in the world. That is the pinnacle of self-righteousness. And self-importance. In this country, you may be brethren, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Catholic, even atheist. Consensus in religion or lack of religion is not a high priority here, but we all better be good Americans. When a pinch of incense is demanded, you may say, eh? Hey, without this country, you wouldn't have the freedom to worship. And it's true that it might not be as easy to worship, that it might personally cost me more if I wasn't in this place at this time. But to say that I could not worship God in another country, whether it's an atheistic country, a totalitarian country, or whatever, is simply a, a denial that the church has existed under all kinds of difficult circumstances, it's also a denial that it is the living God, the Holy Spirit, which sustains the church. And that's you and I, brothers and sisters. Not an art. Not my particular country or government. It may cost you less in terms of persecution here, but that may or may not be a good thing. The one thing we do know is that our allegiance belongs first and finally to Jesus Christ. So what, in our, what is our attitude supposed to be towards our nation? We are to love our nation. But there are three kinds of love you need to be aware of. There is critical love, there is worship love, and there is nurture love. Now, if you have a little child, and all you do is critique that child, only say bad things about that child, mentioning every time that child fails, only looking at the negative side, then your understanding of love it has to do with being critical. If you, on the other hand, you, you practice worship love for that child, well, little Johnny or little Susie can't do a thing wrong. And you, and you, and you no matter what you tell their parents or tell them, uh, no critique at all. No, not, nothing is allowed. But is that authentic love? If you are never able to examine that, which is a shortcoming, which is a struggle, which where you need to improve. The final aspect is nurture love, and that is the authentic kind of love we need, the kind of love where we see the person as they are. We can critique the negative, but we can celebrate the good and the positive in that person and have to find that delicate balance. And that's how you raise a child in a healthy way. Same thing goes for how we love our country. If all I ever do is find its failures and critique it, and talk about everything wrong with it, and being able to point out every single thing, I do it no great benefit. I harden my heart towards my country. On the other hand, if all I practice is worshipful patriotism and I cannot see its darkness and cannot and, and always find an excuse for it, then that is unhealthy for my country. But finally, to practice nurture love toward a country, seeing it as it is loving it in the midst of its shortcomings, 
trying to change those, but also affirming and seeing what is positive and good. That is the kind of love that we're to practice toward our country. In the end, we must love our country, not with a critical love, certainly not with a worship love, but with a nurture love. It will be hard to maintain the balance at times, but you must. You must. And you must pray for kings and all who are in high positions and pray for them in the midst of their temptation so that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Pray for them. We certainly should have been praying for Trump. We certainly should be praying for Biden. We certainly should be praying for governors. And those who serve on councils. And those who serve locally. Pray for them that they may not be seduced by the temptation of power which is what Paul warns us about. And if it's that big a deal there, power, it's probably a big deal in our lives too. Sometimes we fantasize that if we had enough power over another person, we could make them go in a certain direction. And God never practices that. God always moves us through the one power that never changes and that transforms and that changes us forever. The power of love. Brothers and sisters, whether with our nation, our leaders, our community, practice love. And God will work through your love. That's the promise.